Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to part two with the Harvey Building Products for the Pandemic Survival Guide for Residential Contractors. Back here with Harvey, and uh, look, things are changing almost daily. So in the 50 or so contractors we speak with weekly, we're gonna share some strong best practices, what's working and some things to really help you work more effectively. I wanna go ahead and unmute Nicole. Nicole, good afternoon, how are you? I'm good, David, how are you? Good, I didn't see Mark, so I didn't know if you wanted to do a simple introduction here in the beginning. Yep, I think he is tied up today, but um, as always, we just, we're, you know, we're thinking about our customers and hoping everybody's staying safe um, and staying healthy. And we hope that you guys enjoyed that the content that we put out for you guys and that it's informative. Um, that's pretty much it. We thank you for joining us today. And thanks for the invite, Nicole. We uh, will do this every Thursday for the balance of April. And uh, look, if you see this, you see have questions or concerns, we're easy to follow up with. We'll give you some contact information toward the end of the webinar. So let me do a simple introduction here. I'm David Luperger, former building contractor, and uh, am very, very uh, aware of what you're going through. Sat where you're sitting now, and so we really want, as I mentioned, to bring some building practices. And as you can see from the three, screen, the three screens, I'm here with my two business partners. Uh, 60 is the new 40. So we're not old, all right? The key point yeah. is we're experienced. No, 40 is the new, yeah, 60 is the new 40. I'll go with 60 that. 60 is the new 40. Let's go with that. All right, okay, so toward that. that end, let me introduce each of my business partners. We all bring very complimentary skills. Paul, tell them a little bit about you. Well, I've been doing this for 35 years, which is hard to do when you're 40. <laughs> yeah, I, I've worked with hundreds of contractors over the years between, you know, two, two employees to 150 employees between, you know, a million to 100 million. And over that time, I've learned a lot. But this is new territory for me. I mean, I've been through three recessions, or more than that, about eight recessions, we can't all. And this is all new. I've been doing this for a long time with a lot of companies and hopefully we can offer some good advice. Ed, how about you? Ed, you're on mute. Excuse me, my friend. Oh, okay, there we go. There Sorry you go. About that. Huh, so my name is Ed Earl. I, uh, I'm in, based in San Diego, California. I run a construction project management company here working as an owner's rep so i'm working with the homeowners that are building uh, state homes or doing high-end remodel and uh, been in construction for about uh, 30 years actually started in the residential or the, the commercial side and, and now on the, the uh, residential side so uh excited to be here thank you all for for joining us um we've got some updates um from where we were yet last week with the the, the aid the CARES aid situation, and then um, got some uh, some new content for you as well. So, should we uh, get started, hey. David? Yes, now, please. Now, can I start with a very positive note, guys? Please. We now know people yes. that have actually gotten the money. I mean, we have one guy got 150000 right. yesterday, another guy got 100000 yesterday, one guy got like, like 60000 a day. So, this is not theoretical money. It's actually showing up in people's checking accounts as we speak. So I think that's a good way to right. start, right? That is a great way that, to start. That is. That's a, yeah. And there's there's some some hitches and changes, which I'm going to go over here uh, shortly. But yeah, but the, the good news is that the money is starting to flow. So um, let me just real quickly review with you the intent of, this, of these weekly webinars, which is given what we've just been discussing, how quickly things are changing. Um, our intent here is to really give you the most up-to-date information um, and provide for you any resources that you can take advantage of, as well as give you some advice and, and hopefully a little bit of inspiration in how to deal with the challenging times here. And um, we've all got challenges uh, during, this, during these uh, circumstances, but there are lots of opportunities as well. And so we're going to help you to, to recognize and leverage those opportunities as well. So let's do a, first a quick check-in on where we are here, the state of the nation. Um, I um, uh, showed you this last week, and so we've had some changes since then. 
we're now down to uh, seven states that, that don't have any type of restriction on construction. So you can see the change that's occurred in the last week and a half or so. And uh, we've picked up a couple of more red states now. Those red states are the ones where, um, risk for where construction is now um, restricted and prohibited. So if you're in one of those red states, you're already shut down. If you're in one of the neighboring states, I would just suggest to you that there's a possibility that you might get shut down here in the next week or two. Um, share with you some experience from our clients that are in those states. Um, one of our clients in Pennsylvania was shut down. Uh, and the key thing here is they don't give you much of an advance notice. So he was only given about a 48 hour notice and he was literally in the final week of, of finishing out a house and turning it over to his client. So he just pulled all of his crews together and they just worked like 24 seven and basically finished out the house and they were able to get it done. Um, another client that, that uh, David and I spoke with on Monday in Washington, they've been shut down, but they, they recognize that you can't just leave a, a half-framed house sitting out in the elements for a month or two. So they're allowing them to get to the point where the house is dried in. So basically, by the time you get your roof paper on and your, your, your house wrapped and the windows in, once you get it dried in, then you have to stop at that point. So another recommendation we're giving to people is if you're balancing your construction work right now, give a little bit more attention to any of your jobs where you're doing interiors work, because if you get shut down, that's the work that's going to get shut down. Um, if you're in a framing or foundation situation, you should be allowed to continue until, until you get that house dried in. So, all right, so that's the, the status with that. Here, this is just a review of what we talked about last time, which is um, the CARES Act. We have a much clearer picture now on, on where things stand. Um, last week when we talked, we really didn't know where things were, but there's basically four different sources of of potential aid for both uh, contractors as well as their employees. So the first one is this economic injury disaster loan. And this is something that came live actually a couple of weeks ago, but it was originally you had to apply, uh, fill out paperwork. We had some people try to do it with the email. Some people mailed in their application. This is now being all done online. And I'm going to walk you through the steps of how we can actually apply for that online here in just a minute. The next program is the Payroll Protection Program. This one just came live on Friday. And this one, you cannot apply online um, directly. You have to do it through your bank. And it depends on which bank that you're with. And I'm gonna share with you some more information about that um, in a minute. Um, and while it is considered a loan, um, there's a very good chance that you can actually get the loan forgiven so that it acts more like a grant than a loan. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. The third area is um, what, uh, what my son likes to call free money from Trump. This is the, the money that's going to be distributed directly to workers and families. It's uh, $1,200 to each person and $500 per child. Um, but there is a, a hitch on that, and it's that you have to be below the income levels. So as an individual, filing individually is $75,000, and for a married couple's filing uh, as, a, as a couple, it's $150,000. Um, now, again, this is not in your, your salary. This is your adjusted gross income that shows on your 2019 tax return. So if your AGI for a married filed couple is $150,000 or less, then you'll get the $1,200. If it's between $150,000 and $200,000, you'll get a, a, an adjusted amount smaller than the $1,200. And if you made over $200,000 as a couple or over um, $100,000 as an individual, you unfortunately won't get any of that money. And then the fourth and final source of aid is for unemployment benefits. So they've extended the unemployment benefits, they've increased it by $600 a week, and you can do that for up to an additional four months. Um, but hopefully none of your employees are gonna have to do that because if you take advantage of the payroll protection plan, 
then you don't have to be laying your employees off. All right, so um, now let me give you the caveat to that. So uh, just a couple of days ago, Trump uh, removed the inspector general who was actually to oversee that full $2.3 trillion worth of aid. So that whole package now is uh, in somewhat of a disarray because the person that was heading it up is no longer in their job. So I also want to point out too, let me just jump back to this previous slide here. The total amount of this aid, $2.1 trillion, that's with a T, that is the largest fiscal stimulus policy in U.S. history. To put it in perspective, it's 9% of our annual gross domestic product here in the U.S. So it's just a huge, huge amount of money. All right, so let's um, move forward and let's talk about how do you apply for the economic injury disaster loan. So this is uh, an easy uh, process you can do in literally 10 or 15 minutes online. So you go to this website, sba.gov, and you'll see the picture of our friend there, the coronavirus, and you want to click on that red box that says learn more. That will then take you to this page where it will give you all of the different loan programs that we talked about, the Pay Check Protection Program, as well as the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. You want to click on that, that, um, that where it says click here, where I've highlighted that. Let me just uh, expand this a little bit more so you can see this. So down where it says to apply for a COVID-19 Economic Injury Disaster Loan, click here. So that's what you want to do. So once you click on that, it's going to take you to this page. Now, this is a simple five-step process for applying for this loan, um, and it's basically three simple pages. I did it last week in about 10 minutes. Um, Paul, I know you did it as well. Almost all of our clients have. Hopefully, some of you here on this webinar have. If you haven't, do it today. It'll take you 10 minutes. I'm going to show you the information that you need. You don't need much financial information on your company, but do it today because these loans are going so quickly that if you don't get in the queue, my feeling is that by the end of this week, by tomorrow, this money is going to be gone. So the first thing that you have to do is fill out this eligible in entity verification, which basically just means that you're uh, an employer that has less than, than uh, 500 employees um, and that you're not engaged in any illegal activity and that um, you are not an agricultural enterprise. So once you've answered all those questions and gone through this first step, that then takes you to the second page where you'll now fill out your, your business information. So you put down your business legal name, you put down your EIN if you're, a, if you're a, an entity or your social security number, if you're a sole proprietor, what type of an organization you have. And then there's two simple questions that they're going to ask you about your business. The first one is this, where it says your gross revenue for the 12 months prior to the date of the disaster. Now, if you're like me, you probably didn't know exactly, by the way, when the date of the disaster is, which is January 31st. So uh, if you don't have the, the, the 12 months prior to January 31st, just use the 12 months from your previous tax return for 2019. That's what I did. And that's going to be close enough. No one's going to really question that um, anyway. And then the second line is your cost of goods sold for the previous 12 months or, again, for your, your tax year of 2019. Now, it's important here to recognize that this isn't just your cost of goods sold from a construction standpoint. This is your cost of goods sold, all of your operating expenses, okay? So includes your general and admin office expenses, everything down to the water cooler in your office. You want to put all of those down. But the one key thing that we've been told, and last week we had um, someone on one of our webinars who is good friends with the local SBA, the head of the SBA, what you have to do is make sure that your gross revenue is higher than your cost of goods sold. So they want to make sure that you're showing a profit. They don't want to give you a loan if you're, you're showing a loss. All right? So once you get that filled out, then that will take you to this page. This is the third, um, third page. Now, this is important because this first question here, it says, is your business owned by a business entity? Make sure to answer that question, yes or no. Uh, what they mean is, 
are you incorporated? Is your, do you have a business entity like an S corp or a C corp or an LLC? If you don't answer that question, which I didn't the first time I went in to fill this out, when you get to the bottom of the page, it won't let you go further. And then you have to go back up and check this box and then it deletes everything on this page and you have to start over again. So just make sure that you answer that question at the top. And then once you do, assuming probably most of you have a business entity, then you're going to need to fill out the information for both the business entity, the S Corp or the C Corp or the LLC, as well as your own personal information. So you'll be putting your tax ID number for the business entity and then your social security number for your, your own personal information as well. All right, then that moves us on to the fourth page where there's some additional information. Uh, they wanna make sure that you haven't been suspended or debarred from the federal government, that you haven't been convicted of any felonies or any criminal offenses. And then there's a section in there if you had someone help you prepare this information, but um, it's so easy, you really don't need anyone to help you. You definitely don't need to have your CPA help you out. Now, this is where things get interesting. The bottom part of this fourth page, this is what you get. I would like to be considered for an advance of up to $10,000. So you check that box, you enter your bank name, your account number, and your routing number, and that's it. Now, the first time I saw this, I was very suspect of this. I thought this was some scam that some someone had created in some you know, foreign country and then we we're basically just fleecing my, my bank account. I will tell you this, I put my bank routing number and my bank account in 10 days ago. I haven't seen the money, but I'm checking every day and nothing's come out right. of my account either. So this is, this is legit, a, we've had many, many people do this. There's, yeah. an, there's an update on this. Unfortunately, it was $10,000, but now, my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they've changed the rules, so it's $1,000 per employee. So exactly. if you have, like, yeah. in my case, I have, the only, the, only, the only W-2s I have are myself and my wife. Everybody else is a 1099. So I can only get $2,000 instead of 10. Right. Exactly. Yep. And I'm going to show you a little more information about that here, here in a minute. But, okay. So anyway, fill it out. They don't give you the option to even say how much you want. It says, but notice it does say considered for an advance of up to $10,000. So then you'll move on to this fifth and final step where actually it's just going through and they're just uh, summarizing the information. So you go back through, just make sure that you've got your email address correct and you've got all of your the, the social security number and your EIN correct and, and all of the information correct. And then you'll hit submit and you'll see this page. So uh, that's it. Your application is submitted. Make sure to either print out this page or write down that application number. It'll also confirm the email address that it will follow up with you. Now this is important. No one that we know of has received any kind of an email confirmation. So if you don't receive an email confirmation, don't panic. It doesn't mean that it wasn't submitted correctly. No one has received any kind of email confirmation. So just make sure that you keep a copy of your application number and print that out and just make sure that you keep that, keep that handy. Okay, so let's discuss a few things here. Um, in the application, it says here that it is a loan but it says right here that this loan advance will not have to be repaid. So according to what we're seeing here, this is actually this $10,000 portion of it is a grant, it's not a loan. Now, but it also says right here that the economic injury loans will be made available within days of a successful application. Well, it has been 10 days I'm, for, I'm me still waiting. for many of our clients. And yeah, we're all, we're all still waiting. So anyway, um, and this is what Paul was talking about earlier. This just came out. I just found this on an Inc. Uh, Inc. Magazine article that came out um, yesterday, which is that the SB, SBA's $10,000 disaster loan comes with new caveats. So in a bulletin on April 6th, um, the SBA has decided to implement a $1,000 cap per employee on advances up to the maximum of $10,000. So for example, if you have three employees in your business, you're only gonna get $3,000.
Now, what's interesting is that this bulletin that came out again on April 6th, which was what, um, um, uh, what would that be, a Monday, uh, yeah. said that the advances will be distributed beginning this week. Well, again, we haven't, haven't received anything. None of our Let me go check right away. See if they got the money yet. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. So also, it says the advance can be rolled into the PPP loan and subtracted from the amount that gets forgiven. So, um, so that's, that's interesting as well. And um, this is also recounting what I said earlier, which was when they said the loans would be issued within three days, they're now saying that the three-day stipulation seems to have gone outside, out of the window as well. So again, this just came out. Um, and uh, it's, again, as we said, it's changing every day. So you just really don't know. But let's move on now to the Paycheck Protection Program, which is the second loan that all of you should be applying for as well this week. So this is another $350 billion. This is separate from the $350 billion that's under the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. This is also for any companies that have less than 500 employees. And the amount of this loan is determined to be two and a half times the borrower's average monthly payroll cost. All right. So let's say you've got uh, $40,000 in your annual payroll cost, then you could actually borrow $100,000, which is two and a half times no, no, that. that I, I think that's not your, not your annual pay, monthly, not annual I'm payroll sorry. cost. Correct. Yes, thank you for that. It's your monthly payroll, not your annual. Some people were saying that it was two and a half times your annual, but you're correct. Thank you for that, Paul. It's two and a half times your monthly payroll. Now, there's a few other catches and limits as well. One is that you're limited to $100,000 of annual salary for any one key individual. So if you're paying anyone over $100,000, you have to bring that back down. The maximum loan amount is $10 million. The interest rate is 0.5%. But again, you shouldn't even have to worry about the interest rate because these loans will be forgiven for expenses that you incurred during the first eight weeks after the loan. And as long as you don't lay anyone off or reduce your, your payroll by 25% or more, then you, this loan is forgiven. Now, there's some questions I have, I have about a, a question if you lay you. people off I have, or bring them back. So let's say I applied for, you know, eight. my payroll is 40. I applied for 40 plus 40 plus 20. So I applied for 100, right? Now, mm -hmm. the only thing I can make expenses, let's say my expenses are only 80, that extra 50% on two and a half times, I've got to either come up with pay, I got to come up with rent or something to come up with that other $20,000, right? Or it won't be forgiven. Correct. Right, exactly. And so right here, you can use that money for payroll costs, mortgage interest, lease payments on like utility uh, vans or <laughs> trucks or whatever, and utility payments. So those are the, the qualified expenses that you can use the money for. The money is based on your monthly payroll, but you're allowed to use it on more than just the payroll expenses. All right, so let's talk about how you actually apply. Uh, initially, um, we thought that the best way to apply was online through the larger bank, Chase, Wells Fargo, B of A. What we've realized now is that that is not a good idea. I'm no. with B of A, Paul, you're with Chase. We spent the Can week- You wanna give our story? To that. <laughs> yeah, Is this go ahead. Tell, tell our story? Tell, tell okay. your story. Well, my, yeah. So I'm with Chase, and I got the first email that said, hey, you're in, you know, you're in line, apply. Then the second one is said, hey, apply right away because money is limited. So I'm mean, great. So I got to the application and it said it wanted a, you know, 940s, 941s, you know, the payroll plus in corporate tax returns plus, I think, corporate tax and a bunch of stuff. So I didn't have that. So I called my CPA and I said, Priscilla, can you do this for me? And she goes, no, according to the blah, blah, CPAs Association, we cannot do that for you because you're saying that it's you and we're not you, so we can't do it for you. Okay, fine. So then I got it all. She, she put everything on a Dropbox. 
He sent me all the information in Dropbox that I needed, and I got on the form and it said upload. So I went to upload, and I went way over the night. It just says, this is too much information. I was limited to five megabytes per total, you know, per thing for total, and I had like 40 megabytes of information. So it would not work. So I had to go to my computer guy and get him to condense it, you know, I, what's the computer worst thing? You know, reduce it to less than five megabytes. They did that. I uploaded it. And then I finally got, congratulations, you have applied. Um, and that took me, you know, three or four hours. And we'll see what happens. Now, unlike some of my lucky friends, I have not gotten any money yet. So we'll see if this works. Right. Yeah. And I had kind of a similar experience. I'm with B of A. So I was able, B of A was the first people to come online, the first bank to come online last Friday at 6 a.m. So I got my email, I went in, I logged in on everything. The problem is that in order to do this online, I think with these larger banks, you have to have two things. You have to have three things. You have to have an online um, account already set up with them. You have to have a business checking account and you have to have a business loan uh, currently in process which means that you either card. have a credit card, right, you either have a credit card or you have a business loan. And the problem I had is that my business credit card is on a different tax ID number than the tax ID number I use to pay my, my salaries. So I couldn't, it didn't work. So then I was faced with scrambling, trying to find someone else that would do the PPP. Fortunately, I found the Bank of Southern California. I know someone who's with that local bank here in San Diego. I called him up, he sent me an application. Within two hours, me and my bookkeeper had uploaded everything that we needed. It was 61 pages worth of documents. It was like 29 megabytes. Fortunately, he had an FTP remote site that we could upload everything, so I didn't have to reduce my file size like Paul did. And literally within two hours, he said, your loan is submitted and you're, you're in. So that's the kind of personalized attention that you can get. So if you have a local bank, go to your local bank. Uh, as of right now, we've heard two of our clients that have actually gotten the money, and both of them went through their local banks. One was in Arkansas, and one was in Montana. So And, and rumor has it that Wells Fargo is not taking take applications anymore, right? Correct. I had another wow. client that, that tried to apply on Friday. Wells Fargo said they weren't set up yet wait until Monday, he waited till Monday, and then he tried to apply again, they said well, they weren't ready, and then he didn't hear anything till Wednesday, and Wednesday he just got an email that said, sorry, but Wells Fargo isn't accepting any more applications. So it's very, very confusing, and you're much better off going with a local bank. Now, what do you need to submit? Well, this is another question, because everyone kind of seems to be a little bit different. There's an application that you have to submit that you used to be able to get online, but as of Friday, they've changed that. So make sure you get the application from your lender. Don't go on to the Treasury site and get that application because that's not right. You're definitely going to need all of your 2019 payroll tax information, your 940s, 941s, W2s, W3. And they're also going to want the 2020 payroll information through February 15th. So that part is all seems to be the same. But after that, there's all different types. Um, I think I, I had to submit my business entity information, my articles of incorporation and bylaws. Did you have to do that, Paul? Yeah, I did. For, yeah, thanks for that. Also. Okay. Uh, you know, in, in regards to responses, Ed, we've got uh, George yeah. is saying, you know, be sure to check your junk mail because yeah. – that's a good you point. know, yeah. you got to catch the email when they respond. So nice suggestion, right. George. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. That's a good point, George. Thanks for that. Another one of our clients, they had to submit color copies back in front of their driver's license. I didn't have I, to do I that. I had a client that uh, did the same thing, color copies. Front you had to do your driver's license. license. Okay. Yeah. And then and I didn't do mine when my CPA did. Ah, okay. Good. And then also another one was um, P&L, that some, some banks are requiring a full uh, your P and L for the r running 12 month P and L. So that's another potential yeah. document. Maybe I can explain well. why this is true because th the bank is actually loaning you the money, not the federal government. And then the federal government right. is backing that loan up. And then if you meet all those requirements, 
the federal government is going to grant the money to the bank to pay off the loan. If you don't meet those requirements, you just have an SBA loan with your bank. So again, the bank is loaning you the money, not the government at this point. That's why right. it's different. Exactly. Exactly. So, and um, and then if you look at the bottom of this slide here, this is a little bit of an unsettling statistic. So Bank of America alone reported on its first day, which was Friday, they had 85,000 customers submit applications for a total of $22.2 billion of the $350 billion that's available. So that's one bank on one day. So that's why we're saying apply for this money today, definitely this week, because there's a very good chance that all of this money is going to be gone by the end of the week. All right. So I think cover this later, about, Ed. Go ahead. Um, uh, let me, let me who's eligible? And then, okay. Yeah. And, and then we'll go through it. So this is the application that for the Paycheck Protection Program. And I just want to point out a couple of things because my application, actually, my lender had to send it back to me because I missed a couple of things. One is that when it says for checking the purpose of the loan, make sure that you check more than just the payroll. Check lease and check utilities because what he told me is that if you're using the money for more than payroll, it moves you up higher in the queue as far as uh, qualifying for the loan. The second thing is that while all of the stuff on the first page is just a checking of a yes or no box, like have you been convicted of a felony? Have you defaulted on any loan? There's two particular questions that require you to initial on those applications. So make sure that you initial on those two applications. Don't just check the, the check box. Um, so this needs to be a paper so next, copy, right? Yes, right, a paper copy. So another question that some of our clients have asked is, well, what happens if we lay some of our employees off right now, and then when we get the money, we bring them back on? Does that, does that uh, uh, cancel our loan forgiveness? And the answer is no. Uh, a PPP loan will be forgiven to the extent that the payroll paid to the rehires or the new hires provided that the layoffs occur after February 15th and before April 26th. And this came from a, from a labor attorney that Paul knows, who's one of the top construction, uh, construction attorneys in San Francisco. Right, Paul? Yep. Okay. All right. Another question is, you know, what, how do we know that this loan will be forgiven? And this is from uh, a resource that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has put together, and um, that as long as you uh, apply the money to any one of these four or five sources of expenses, the money will be forgiven. So now I want to tell you that this is very confusing, and we have identified a couple of really key documents that answer all of these questions. One is where this was taken from, which is a four-page document that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has put together. The U.S. Department of Treasury has also put together a 31-page, pretty comprehensive treatment of the payroll protection plan. So we have copies of both of those. If you're interested in those, please contact us, either email us or call us, and we'd be happy to send you that information as well. So at this point, um, that pretty much walks you through what you need to know as far as applying for these loans. They're very, as I said, changing every day. A lot of confusion surrounding this. You now know the most up-to-date and comprehensive information. And I'm going to turn this over to Paul, and Paul's going to show you how you can actually use this new information that you have about the loans to be able to kind of, in a marketing way, be able to help you in developing some of your relationships in your business. You know, I think this comes, I, I don't think people, you know, when you're, you know, there's not many enemies in a foxhole, right? I mean, so everybody becomes friends. Well, this is a bit of a war, even though the, the enemy is very small. Um, I'll point out a couple of things. I believe the difference between marketing and sales. Marketing is finding people that need your help. And sales is getting the people to commit to that help. Now, in the past, this help has been around, I need help building my house, or I need help from, if you're an architect, I need my help from my client building his house. And then getting them to commit was when they signed to the contract, which is still true. But now there's some other advantages. Um, 
marketing in, includes building relationships, trade partners with prospects and customers. Now, what we've just given you, everybody has, you know, like, I don't know, if you, you know, you meet somebody in a bar and say, what's my sign, right? So you're trying to figure out some reason to have a conversation. Well, I found that architects are the key to the kingdom haven't done this 35 years. We have a whole program on how you get a lot of work from architects. But our problem has always been you know, they have a girlfriend and it's not you. So how do you get to meet this architect? How do you build a relationship with that architect? Well, I think this crisis is a great opportunity to do that because you can call them out and you can say, hey, if you apply, if not, you can get good information. In fact, we have a letter that's in architects who's going to ask us for it. But it's an opportunity to meet architects and share a common problem, which is how do I get the money? Now, even after this webinar, you can say, hey, we just listened to a consulting firm and people are actually getting the money. It's a true story. Um, so that's, you know, like as of today, so it's happening. So if you want to build relationships with architects, I suggest you make a list of architects that you know, call them and just say, hey, did you apply? What happened? I applied, this is what I found out. Here's to give some good place to get some information. Again, anytime you're talking to somebody, you are building a relationship with that person. So it's an awesome time to do that. Now, trade partners, you may not actually, you know, they're not going to give you any business, but the better you know your trade partners, the higher up on the list you are. An example would be, I've you know done this for a long time, and all subcontractors have their list of the A, B, and C contractors. And when push comes to shove, and they only have a few people to send out, the A contractor always gets them, and those people have to wait for the schedule. So if you love your, you know, trust or whatever, your, your trade partners, you need to help them out here. You need to get a hold of them. And if they haven't applied, you need to do it. I mean, it just, I talked to a guy today and his drywall contractor said, you know, what love? What are you talking about? Or they, the electrician said, I have no idea what's going on here. You know, they, some contractors are not built to apply for grants. They have a hard enough time getting a bill in. So my guess is your expertise as of in the seminar is better than theirs. So if you want to create loyalty with your subcontractors, I would call them, tell them they need to apply, you can send to this webinar and make sure they've applied. Because what you don't want to have happen is let's say you apply and you get your, you know, $50,000 and you go, hey, Joe Plummer, I got my $50,000. He goes, how'd you get that? Oh, I applied for a loan. You did? How come you didn't tell me? Well, I didn't think about it. <laughs> so um, it's a good way to build relationships with your subcontractors and they deserve the money just like anybody else. Unfortunately for this money, the people that get the money are the people that act first and are good at filling out forms. Not necessarily people that need it. This is not need based. So, I mean, we've got a client, he's got a million in his checking account and he just got funded for $200,000. You know, so it's not need based. It's basically, if you know how to do the forms and you get the forms in, you get the money, at least that's our understanding. So work with your architects, build relationships with them, maybe designers, maybe real estate people, anybody you're trying to build a relationship with or your subcontractors, this is a great excuse to have a pretty meaningful conversation. If you have any questions about that, you can give me a call. It's Paul Sandham and there's my phone number, 415-599-9006. I'd be happy at no charge to tell you how to implement this, how to call the architects, what to say, I've got some letters you can send and it's actually working for clients right now. So give me a call. It's all relationship, isn't it, Paul? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm sure you've heard the saying, this is, this is a, a test for uh, David there. What are the three most important things in sales? Relationship, relationship, relationship. Yes. You've been to my seminar. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I took notes. This is the way. That's right. So this is the way to build the three most important items in any relationship that matters to you, whether it's a real estate person, and a, a, you know, architect, subcontractor, designer. It's a great opportunity. All right. Well, let's go one step further with this, because as a former contractor, you know, I would put together my schedule every week and uh, what employees need to be on what job site, what materials needed to be there, what trade contractors were assigned. And I'd review that with the homeowner in regards to what's happening that week. Guess what? No schedule went according to plan. And as a working contractor and you understand this, you're amending what's happening on a weekly basis. 
to a certain extent, we're many crisis managers because we're dealing with so many moving parts and managing this in a proactive fashion. So you've got a skill set that most people don't have. So I want you to think about this crisis in a similar fashion because every crisis presents an opportunity. So let's talk about how to adapt and plan in this present environment as a building contractor. Go ahead, next slide. There you go. So, you know, we don't know what's gonna happen in a month, in six weeks, and, and your clients don't know. The designers, your subcontractors. We don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. <laughs> we don't know what's gonna happen. So my, my strong suggestion is this, because you're doing this in your business. Take it week by week. So you've listened to this today. When you get to work tomorrow or on Monday, your proactive approach is what can I do this week? All right, is there a loan I can apply for? Is there someone I can follow up with? What do I communicate to my clients, existing clients? If there's not a work stoppage, how are you working with them? Be proactive. What can I communicate to potential clients? What's going on? How are we moving forward? And I'll guarantee you, you've got employees that are wondering, will they have a job next week? And your ability to proactively manage that concern. And I said in the previous webinar, look at a 30-day run rate and do this in a bite-sized fashion. How do we make it through April? How do we make it into the beginning of May? It gives you a proactive ability to communicate with those people who are legitimately concerned and not just your employees. Think about trade contractors. So basically, where can we take a leadership role in this crisis as it's unfolding? How do we lead? What are the short-term solutions? What can we manage and what can I communicate? And so again, my strong recommendation what can I do in the next week? And simply speaking, there's energy and movement. Some people are paralyzed during this thing. I don't know what to do. Start moving. Even if it's the wrong direction, you're going to figure it out. Your, your staff, your subcontractors, your clients want to see that proactive movement. Show them what you can do and lead by example. Ed? David, let me share with you some, some things that our clients have done. One Good. is we've noticed that it sort of goes one of two ways. If people have money and the resources, they realize that it's going to be harder to get inspections, harder to get cabinets, harder to get dry. It's all, the supply line is going to be interrupted. You know, and hopefully you didn't order for tile from Italy, you're really in trouble. So it's all going to get interrupted. So the question is, you can use this as a closing tool by sharing information, saying, look at, let's get the money in now, let's order the cabinets. I mean, people put a whole bunch of cash up front for some people to get all the stuff and get it now before it runs out, sort of like standing in, you know, Costco waiting for toilet paper. So it's the same thing right at your doors. So there's there's a sense of urgency. So you can get people to commit, and the same thing with entitlements, it's kind of hard to get permits. You know, a lot of people are actually using, you know, uh, iPhones and, and FaceTime to get permits and that kind of thing, or expected, excuse me. So there's a sense of urgency. Communicating that sense of urgency, not desperation, but urgency, can get people to commit to maybe the design process, to fill out a pre-construction agreement, to mail orders and stuff, make some decisions they weren't making before. So sharing this information is an opportunity to move people forward to get them to commit. Now, on the other hand, some people who have more limited resources are bailing. They're going, I don't know, I'm not sure. I mean, I own a real estate company and all my rentals are not paying, whatever it is, then they may bail. So it may go either they're committed or they may bail. But you need to be proactive in helping you make those decisions. I think, you, you know, your clients, uh, your staff, they want you to lead and, and take the lead and move. They want to see something moving forward. They want to see that positive movement, that, that change, that, that activity. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, let's just, um, I want to just review this as we're getting close to the end of our, our webinar here. Uh, something we covered last week, but it continues to be just as relevant uh, this week as last week and will really continue going forward. And that's be informed, stay connected, and keep positive, right? The information is changing so quickly. 
not only about what how it affects us in the residential construction industry, but obviously how it affects us as individuals and as a nation. So stay informed, but don't binge watch on that nightly news because that's just a recipe for producing anxiety and getting you overwhelmed. So take your information in measured doses, take it from reliable sources. There's so much great information available now on the internet that you can find all the information you need without having to read the sensationalized version of it on the evening news or or on what's coming across your your Twitter feed. The next thing is to connect with your peers. You know, use this time to reach out to people in your Builder 20 group or your Remodelers Advantage group or or reach out to us. Reach out to people that know so that you can continue to share and build that support. Um, the third is to be optimistic about the long term. But as David said, focus on short-term solutions. Focus on what you can do next tomorrow and next week. And then the last is be selective as to who you share your concerns with, all right? I get scared, I get anxious, but I don't necessarily go and talk about, talk to everyone about that, with that, right? Your employees need to see you as a leader, as a competent leader. So you don't share your concerns with those people. You can share it with people on your board of directors, share it with a business coach or with us if you, if you like. If your wife is in the business, you could share it with her, obviously. If she's not, you may want to think twice before sharing some of this information with your wife. They're dealing with their own issues, right? If you got kids at home and all of the other stresses that are going on. And just remember that this too will pass, right? This is a very definitive event that's going to have a, a, an end. We don't know exactly when it is, but it will end at some point and we'll all get through this together. So. Uh, let's um, button things up here. I just want to remind like you that, that um, go ahead. I was saying that um, we are available. I mean, a lot of questions, people feel a little, um, I don't know, anxious or whatever about asking questions that it's going to be answered with a bunch of people on a webinar. So we are available, no cost to you. If you come to this webinar, because, you know, you're a guest, um, call us, ask us questions, be specific. How do I apply? What do I do? What didn't work? We are here for you, it won't cost you anything. Just give us a call, there's our phone numbers. Um, we all have a little different expertise. You know, Ed's the like computer wizard of the universe, I'm into marketing and David's in the systems. But you know, we all have our own expertise. So give us a call, we're happy to help you, no charge, but for us to help you, you gotta give us a call. And another, another resource that we're offering to everyone on this webinar as well is we are doing free weekly group coaching sessions. Now, those are Wednesday at 9 a.m., uh, which uh, Pacific 12 noon Eastern. And the purpose of that is, you know, in these webinars, we're giving you a lot of information, but we don't have time to answer your questions and to provide particular individual advice. That's what we do in these group coaching sessions. The other thing that we do in these group co coaching sessions is peer-to-peer -peer support and advice. So just like I said in connecting with your peers, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to connect with your peers, hear from other people in the residential construction industry, hear how they're handling things. In our uh, session yesterday, we had a discussion about what uh, one or two things that people did that was a good thing that they've done and uh, some mistakes that they've made along the way as well. So please, you're uh, more than welcome to join us for that as well. And uh, as Paul said, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. I'll put this screen up again. This is um, all of our phone numbers and our, our email addresses. And uh, please, we are here uh, ready and available for you. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, David and he can uh, close us out. Thank you and Any everybody for David? attending. Paul, did you say something? Uh, is there any questions we can answer? Or are we good? I think we're good. I don't see anything in the panel. But uh, we're going to be back next Thursday, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, in every week, because you see this changing so quickly. You know, either join us, you know, through some of the contact information, but please plan to join us again next week. Every week this is evolving. We will share everything that we know. So thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thanks, Ed, Paul. Let's uh, pick this up again, yeah. same time next week. Okay. Thank see you then. Coming. So long, everybody.